Hey guys, welcome to your Fridays in your Max Allure week. We're so happy to have you here. We're very excited to be here. I'm Dr. Mirdalis Diaz Ramirez. I'm the creator of the Max Allure Mastermind, which is a professional and personal development program for physicians. And uh, we learn there are many things. We learn there about um, setting our vision. We learn about mindset, wellness, business, finance. And uh, we also have our podcast, Design Your Physician Life. And earlier this week on Monday, we had Dr. Corey Fawcett, who came and was uh, with us in, us in our podcast. And he's going to come just any second right now to help us answer some questions, all the questions that you might have about how to design an easy real estate portfolio for the busy professional. And here he is. Hey, how are you? Hey, very good. Nice to Excellent. see you again. This was easy, right? This was easy. So this is like, yeah, how to design an easy checking in into your Facebook life. <laughs> yes. Besides the uh, real estate portfolio. Makes a difference when you practice, I guess. <laughs> yes. So I was telling our audience about our mastermind, about our, our podcast. On Tuesday, we released a podcast when we had you, um, we interviewed you about this very uh, same topic and you had the bonus about the timeshare, which is the book that you released and we're going to go over that. And we also, on Wednesday, we gave you like some tips about how to make it easy based on, on our conversations with Dr. Uh, Fawcett. And during the week, we also went to different places. I went to visit another practice to learn from that practice, went to a lab to learn from that. And um, this week, I've experienced other things as a physician entrepreneur. I have to tell you that I've seen my first patient without that burden on having so many blocks between the patient and myself, the care. So today, I was able to see my first patient in my functional practice medicine, um, functional medicine practice here in Sarasota, Florida that I share with Dr. Arun Rao and Dr. Miranda Phillips. And I'm like, I'm in the clouds right now, cloud nine. So I cannot imagine when you design this portfolio and you're able to, you know, um, uh, be able to practice for joy. I feel very joyful today and I wanted to share that with everybody. So let's go on, guys. I know, welcome to all of you who are here. Welcome, uh, Fiona, Isaac, uh, Jack, all of you who are there uh, joining our podcast and our, our Facebook Live. And we want to ask some questions to Dr. Fawcett. Um, First, can you show us your book? Because we're very excited. It is the new already one? yes, yes. Look at that. We have it backwards. I don't know how to make it for us. I don't know it's how to do that. A guide to loving your timeshare, and we know that that's a little bit controversial. But maybe we can start with a little bit of that because it's already a bestseller, right? Yes, uh, that was, first day it came out. Uh, I hit bestseller status, and that was uh, pretty nice. It's nice to wake up like that. Um, I wrote this book because I just got sick and tired of everybody telling people how bad timeshares were. I mean, I've been a timeshare owner for 30 years and had a great experience, and it's very economical way to travel to very nice places uh, it, it, with you know, a kitchen, when you have little kids, that kitchen was awesome. They they had their own bedroom, and so we could sleep in, they could sleep in, whoever got up could go to the kitchen and have breakfast. We didn't have to get dressed up and go to a restaurant or something. But I've had such a great time, I finally decided I'd had enough. I needed to tell people the true story about how to use your timeshare. And the real problem is, is that people get a timeshare but no instructions. You know, it's like having a baby. You have a baby, but no one tells you what you're supposed to do with the baby. No one tells you how to change the diaper. You've got to figure it all out yourself. And that's what happens with timeshares. You get a timeshare, and then you don't get any instructions. And people don't know how to use it. They can't seem to make a trade. They end up not going somewhere, and then they're paying their fees for the year. And, and they get disgruntled and mad, and then they tell everybody how terrible a timeshare is. I, I see the same thing with uh, real estate when you have a um, reluctant landlord who didn't really want to be a landlord, ends up being a landlord because he couldn't sell when he moved, and then it doesn't turn out well, and he's telling everybody how terrible it is to be a landlord. Mm -hmm. But frankly, he doesn't even know what it's like to be a landlord. He just got dumped into this thing and, and didn't know what to do, and it didn't work out well for him, where a little knowledge would have made it a very profitable endeavor. 
And the same thing's true with the time shorter. When you know how to use it, like let's take this year for me. I own one week of timeshare, one week. And I traded it this year for eight weeks of vacations. And my average cost this year to pay for those eight weeks was $311 a week. Now that's cheaper than staying at a Motel 6 and I stayed in a pretty nice places. So timeshares, when you know what you're doing, they're an incredible travel hack. So should we tell people a little bit about um, before getting on a timeshare, who would really qualify to get one? You know, that's uh, another big problem. Uh, when you go to a timeshare sales pitch, which when by the way, go to the hotel never go. And, yeah, to the, <laughs> never, <laughs> never, the never, never go. The free tickets, they're not uh, free. Free tickets, right. free they're tickets. Not free. That will be... <laughs> The end Tell of me you. the most expensive free thing you ever get, okay? You don't want to buy your timeshare at a timeshare sales presentation. That's where you pay super top dollar for it. You want to buy them on the secondary market when you get them close to, to free. Um, why pay $70,000 for something you could buy for $2,000? So you, you want to stay away from there. But the problem is that those people, their, their choice of who should buy a timeshare is anybody who is married, uh, has at least $50,000 a year of income, and is over 25. If you meet those qualifications, they'll sell you a timeshare. Well, the problem is that's not the qualifications of people who should own a timeshare. And when the wrong people end up buying one, then they're unhappy. You know, imagine a a 45-year-old guy with two kids who trades in his minivan and buys a Corvette, and that's the family car. He's going to be very happy because he is not the person who should own a Corvette as an only car. That's a single guy's uh, car if it's going to be your only car. Or an empty nester. Uh, or an empty nester. Or somebody, somebody who, who doesn't have more cars to accommodate everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> if you've got lots of cars, uh, no big deal. You can have an extra one. But... Uh, what I uh, teach people is you need to have different qualifications than they use. Number one, you got to have a lot of uh, vacation time. If you only have two weeks of vacation in your job, when are you going on the timeshare? Because you've got a family reunion this year. You've got your high school class reunion you're going to. You're going to go visit your mom and you wanted to go on this cool cruise. So exactly where were you going to do the timeshare? You don't have enough vacation time to do this. You shouldn't be buying a timeshare. You, you just don't have the bandwidth to put it in there. You know, another group of people who uh, have to watch out for it is the people who don't have enough money to buy the things that come with going to a timeshare. You know, a lot of people see that, oh, I only spent $311 for my housing to go someplace. But then they forget that, okay, if I'm going to take my family there, I have to buy four airplane tickets, I have to rent a car, and I'm going to be buying four sets of tickets for every day at Disney World. And if you don't have the money to do all those things, you're not going to go to Disney World. And then you're going to say, oh, I didn't use my timeshare. It was a terrible thing to have. But the point was, you didn't have the money to vacation like that. That's not and the also, kind of vacation. And also you, you have like to be flexible on your vacation. Like maybe you only have vacation, you have tons of vacation, but maybe in certain periods where it's so high to get the timeshare. So when you buy a week, maybe you get, you know, like three days or something like that that you really didn't. Yeah, if you, cannot, you, have you cannot to be get a the flexible eight weeks, person. You, yeah. You have to yeah, be you have to be fairly flexible. It's super good for somebody with lots of uh, lots of vacation weeks. Like I took eight to twelve weeks of vacation every year, so I had plenty of room to go on the timeshare trips. Um, but if you don't have the ability to be flexible to what's available, like you have to go on this week and this week only, like. Maybe uh, you have work for a company that they have downtime. And when they have downtime, I, I used to work at a plywood mill like that. When the plywood will, mill went down, everybody was on vacation. That was your vacation week. And that was that. And if you have to take vacation at a particular time, 
you'll you will have less ability to get what you want when you're trying for a timeshare. You know, the way I did it, uh, I worked in my uh, general surgery practice, and I always turned in my vacation times a year in advance. So before the call schedule came up, okay. So I made my timeshare trades over a year in advance, and then I told people, oh, I'm not going to be here that week. Don't put me on call that week, you know. And so then my call schedule was made around my vacation schedule. If you let them make the call schedule first, and then you're going to say, okay, I'll try and work my vacations in between, no matter whether you're doing timeshares or anything else, you're going to have less ability to get what you really want to do because you've limited your options. So when you have timeshares, you know, there's only about 4,000 of them to choose from, unlike hotels, which, you know, I don't know, million hotels? I don't know how many to choose many, from. There's <laughs> less, less to pick from. And so you need some flexibility in your schedule so that you can pick what you want. Uh, Tell us and then about people the secondary complain. market. Say That's that again. Secondary. Tell us about the secondary market. How do you get into the secondary market? So there are lots of people who should never have purchased a timeshare and they bought one. And now after they bought it, they've realized they just can't seem to use this thing. They only have two weeks of vacation. They don't have the money to fly someplace. They, they can't use it. And so they're getting rid of their timeshare. Now, those things go for cheap. And there are places, an example is a place called Red Week. Red Week sells uh, timeshares. Um, and they sell the used, so to speak, timeshares, the secondary market timeshares, not the ones from the sales meetings. So the salesmen have already been paid for, the uh, marketing's already been paid for by the person who bought it, just like when you buy a new car. You know, when you drive it off the lot, it goes down in value because all of the profit that had to go to the car dealer was taken out of it. And the same thing happens with the timeshare. So now the timeshare, you can buy a really nice timeshare for under $2,000 for the week and, and the secondary market. And you don't want to go to those high pressure sales meetings to, to buy it, that same timeshare for maybe $50,000 uh, on the primary market and pay all those people's uh, commissions, you want to wait for that same place to go on the secondary market. There was a guy in my book. Uh, at the end of the book, I went around and interviewed different people at the swimming pools at the timeshare where I was at. And one guy told me a story that he went in Hawaii. Now, Hawaii is a very expensive purchase spot. Uh, I own in New Orleans, which is a less expensive purchase spot. But he was in Hawaii, and they offered him this timeshare for 90 something thousand dollars And he whipped out his phone and looked on the secondary market, and he showed the guy, I could buy this same timeshare for $2,000. Why should I buy it from you for 90 something thousand dollars oh my The salesman goodness. wasn't very happy about that. <laughs> but, you know, you should be looking for bargains. Uh, when you're looking for a bargain for a car, you, you want a three- or four-year-old car that somebody else already paid all the commissions on, and now you can just buy the car. And timeshares work the same way. That's amazing. Well, let's move on into the topic that brings us today. That was quite a great bonus, and congratulations on your book. Congratulations on being oh, bestseller just out of the you know out of the gate right there. And um, we're gonna do hashtag uh, guide to loving your timeshare, and we'll also do hashtag live hashtag replay we share this, we're going to go ahead and talk a little bit about how to make a, you know, design an easy portfolio, uh, real estate portfolio, especially for the VC professional, the physicians who are so busy, they don't want to deal with things. And there's different, quite different things that we can do with real estate. Um, you know, you can go from, if you want to really go all the way to passive, you can do like the syndications, but in your case, you were able to build quite the systems um, with something that people would might consider a little bit um, a, more involved, which was multifamily. So tell us about building your teams first, just to have those in place so that you can uh, develop them from the teams to the systems for your uh, real estate, making it easy. So the first uh, question you need to ask yourself is, do I want to manage my property? Okay. 
that's a very big branch point because if you're going to manage your property, you're going to build a different team than if you're not going to manage your property because you want a property management team that ha has everything. So let's, let's look at the easiest one first. The easiest one is what I do today. Today, I hired a property management company to just take care of everything. They already have a team. They have all the people they need. They have all the forms they need. They've got all the know-how they need. They just take care of everything for you and send you the check or the profits. Now, that is the ultimate. I mean, my real estate today takes about as much effort as my 401k does. Uh, you, you buy a property and you put it in the lap of a property management company and let them take care of it. Uh, it will cost you a little bit extra for them to do the work, but that's the trade-off you're going to make. It's just like, say, child care. Either you can go to work and hire somebody to take care of your child, or you can not go to work and you can stay there and take care of your child for free. But you make a whole lot more money if you go to work and have a child care provider because the child care provider does not eat up all of your profits from being a physician. Uh, so the same thing for real estate. If you want it to be super hands off, the only team you need is a good realtor who's uh, good at investing and, and somebody who can help you with your financing, like a banker who's going to uh, bankroll uh, your, your property. And then all the rest of the team, is with the property management company already. Now, if you go back to how I, I didn't do it that way when I started. When I started, I wanted to be the manager. I don't want to be the manager today because I'm retired and traveling all over the place. I thought I was On your timeshare, it's eight weeks of timeshare, right? <laughs> <laughs> eight weeks of timeshares, plus I like to go uh, other things besides that. Uh, I also like to, to I have a motorhome and I take it on trips and I like to do cruises. So, you know, in 2019, before everything shut down, my wife and I were gone 56% of the year on some adventure someplace. Between the timeshares, the motorhome, and uh, cruises, that, that eats up a lot of time. But in the beginning, I was the manager. And it took me only about 10 hours a month to take care of all my properties. And I owned 64 rental units. So it's very easy to automate everything. So what do you need? You need... First of all, you need a realtor. Uh, as a busy, in fact, my book, uh, Real Estate Guide to Busy Professionals, talks all about the things that are different about us busy people. We can't do real estate the same way as the guy who only works 30 hours real a week. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, or the guy who's a full-time realtor, you know, real estate investor or something. Mm -hmm. we, uh, I'm a, I was a full-time doctor. I couldn't spend all my time out there. And so you hear silly things said like, uh, you have to look at 100 properties in order to be able to buy one. Well, frankly, I'm a, I'm a search. I don't have time to go look at 100 properties to buy one. So what I got was a realtor who understood real estate investing because he was a real estate investor himself. And I gave him the criteria that I was looking for. This is what I want to buy. You go find it for me and tell me when you got one. Okay? Now, he's getting paid for this. Make him earn his money. You shouldn't be out there looking at all these things. Let him do it. That's what his job is. Your job so is seeing So he will see patients. the 100 properties for you. He will see the 100 properties for As long as they meet one, me. two, three, four, five criteria, whatever your criteria are, right. then... Whatever you give him for the criteria will determine how often he has to talk to you. What happened to me in my case, instead of seeing a hundred places to buy one, he contacted me only two or three times a year to go look at a property. And I bought one. So I had to only look at two or three places per purchase. That's way better than looking at a hundred for purchase. So get yourself a really good realtor. Now I've had realtors contact me that wanted, they, they learned I was buying property and they wanted to sell me some property, right? And they said, I got this one. I want you to look at it. And I said, great, here are my criteria. When you find something like that, you call me. I'd be happy to buy it from you just like I'd buy it from my realtor. 
And then they'd call me the next day. Hey, I got one. And, the, and, and it didn't meet my criteria. And you'd say, yeah, but it's a great location. You know, location, location, location. Yeah, but it didn't meet the criteria I told you to look for. Well, uh, okay, I'll go find another one. He'd call me the next day. Hey, I got one. And I'd see, it doesn't meet the criteria. You know, so he was just trying to sell me a piece of property. That is not a realtor you want. You want a realtor who understands what you, you want and will look for it for you. I told that guy, please don't call me back again. You don't seem to be able to follow directions. And the reason uh, so for, to, for having some criteria is basically these are businesses. These are not going to be emotional properties. And you want to have the cash flow. You have, want to have like the investment and the um, potential for acquiring more um, value for that property. So you have to be very strict. And also the, one, the things that you want to manage. Because in your case, you had properties that were eight, less than eight doors and eight but I, I think like eight doors was like you're cut off after a certain period of time that you don't, wouldn't get anything less than eight doors because then you do the same amount of work for, for less profit. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I uh, was only interested in multifamily properties. At the time when I started, I would have taken anything. I would have taken a duplex. And I bought a fourplex. That was the one purchase I should have never made. I, 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 let, I had my criteria, and then one of the criteria was it has to be a positive cash flow. It was a slightly negative cash flow, but, you know, it was so close to everything else. I decided to bend the rule, and I bought that one, and I was sorry I did because it took years for that to become a positive cash flow. It wasn't a fixer-upper, you know. It, it, it was um, – and, and, and I bought like – I a owned turnkey between, property? It was pretty much a turnkey property. Mm -hmm. I owned uh, between four and 31 unit complexes, okay? After a while and managing those, I developed the criteria that I'm only going to buy things eight units or more uh, because the, the fewer units it is, the higher cost per door. So the bigger the number gets, the cheaper the price per door, but the rent is the same, basically. You know, rent doesn't keep going down as the units get bigger, but the price does. So you get a better cash flow as you get bigger. The downside is there's a, you know, only so big you might be able to handle financially uh, to make the purchase because you'll have to qualify. Uh, both you and the property will need to qualify to get the loan. And so you might not be able to buy a hundred million dollar property. Uh, whereas you could buy a $2 million. My very first purchase was $1.15 million property. And I bought it with no money down. So my realtor uh, is interesting. He, he met all the criteria. He said, I got one for you. We went and looked at it. Yep, I liked it. I said, this is the offer I want to make. And I'm going to make the offer myself in person. And he kind of said, well, that's not how we do it. I said, well, that's how I do it. I'm going to make the offer in person because it was kind of an unusual offer. It wasn't just, here's a bunch of money and I'm going to finance it at the bank. It was an unusual offer that included an owner carry back. And I decided I wanted to make the offer. And he says, this offer is too low. He'll never take it. I said, I'm going to make that offer. And we, he finally agreed and we went and we made the offer. And the offer was a lower price than the guy wanted but it was everything he actually wanted to do. I interviewed him ahead of time. I knew what he wanted to do with the money. I gave him everything he wanted to do, but not his asking price. He took it. And my realtor said, if I'd have known he'd have taken that, I'd have bought it myself. But I gave him everything he wanted. So how could he not take it? Uh, and and I, in, that, in my book, I actually detailed that purchase exactly how I did it um, what, what was the offer, how it worked out. Um, but you, you need a good realtor. That's, that's probably your very first guy. Cause you can't be running around looking at all these properties. And where did and, you find your realtor? Like, Oh, before I forget, huh. uh, before you answer that question, and then tell me at the bar next door, but, um, uh, if guys, if you have any questions, let us know because we have him here. So we can answer any questions that you have, how to make it easy 
uh, for your real estate portfolio for the VC professional. So where did you find this um, realtor? It was my next door neighbor. Oh, well, <laughs> I just, he just door, fell in my lap. Neighbor. <laughs> he absolutely fell in my lap. The place next door to me went for sale and this guy bought it and he was a real estate investor from Southern California who was retiring and he was moving to Oregon and this was going to be his retirement. And he got his real estate license because he thought he would just do a little real estate selling, buying and selling while he was retired. He moved next door and we're talking about it. And, I, and he just fell in my lap. He's a real estate investor who decided to become a realtor in his retirement. He had sold off all of his properties in Southern California and was retiring on the money and he just wanted to have something to do. So he was going to be a realtor and he just fell in my lap. Um, what I would do if I didn't have somebody like that just fall in my lap is I would ask around. Uh, there's lots of realtors in town. Unfortunately, most realtors are just doing it because it's a job that's easy to get into. And they may not know really anything about real estate. Um, and most of them aren't the official realtor with the license, they work under one. And so they got to run everything by the real realtor. Um, you don't want one of those newbie realtors. Those are okay if you're just trying to buy your own house, because it really doesn't matter who the realtor is. You just got to be found. You have to run into the right house and here it is and I'll take it, you know, but when you're investing, there's a lot of special criteria you're looking for in the property and you need somebody who can really pick those things out because they don't usually show up in the real estate prospectus that it, you got to look between the lines for some of the stuff you're after. Uh, and you for mentioned my criteria. something very important for that guy who fell on your lap. Like he was a real estate investor first. So yes. he knew what it took and he had already sold his property. So he knew like the whole process from your point of view, even though you were starting. He um, was not only a real estate know. investor, he was a successful one yes, who had retired, retired off of his, <laughs> his, his earnings, you know? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you want that kind of guy. So you ask around for that. And then when you meet one, you want to ask them, what real estate investments do you own? If they don't own any real estate investments, they're not the person for you. Now, my guy didn't own any real estate investments because he had recently sold them all, moved and retired. Okay. So, but he had recently owned lots of it. Uh, so you want somebody who's actually had skin in the game and understands real estate investing, not just how to sell a building but he needs to know or she how to actually pick a winner, how to figure out what the cash flow is going to be. I made my realtor do a cash flow analysis before he even called me because it had one of my criteria was that it's be a positive cash flow, even if it was 100% financed so that the potential to do a no money down deal existed. That was something I wanted to do. What happened to me was, I read this book about no money down real estate. I thought, well, that sounds cool. And I went out a month later and bought a place, a million dollar place with no money down. And then I says, I'm just going to buy the rest of them like that. That was fun. And so it became a challenge for me. How can I buy only no money down deals? You know, I didn't need to buy only no money down deals, but I thought it was a cool challenge. And it made this fun for me. It made it a fun game. So he had to be able to calculate that out and estimate that he thought it was a positive cash flow before he contacted me. I do I have a question do because work. you had, you had, we've talked about your teams on making it easy. We talked about the property manager who has access to all these things. You talked about the, um, the financing, you know, while well, you were doing uh, a lot of uh, a, the property owners financing and also your real estate um, realtor actually. But, at the beginning, you were type of building things yourself, like remodeling yourself. You did that for a year. You decided to do that. Um, where did you find finally a good team or did you get for the properties that you were getting there? Were you getting properties that you had to do some type of rehab? And if you were in your criteria that you were able to do, um, you know, add some value that way. 
And so if you found them, where did you find your teams to do the, the building? Was it through your property manager or somebody else? So in the beginning, I was the property manager. The property manager idea came later when I wanted to be retired and I wanted my income to be truly passive. I want to take off and leave, get paid. So then I had a property manager. In the beginning, I was the property manager. So in the very start, I did everything for the property, my wife and I and the kids. And we learned exactly what this takes. And then we began farming out pieces. So the first thing that I did was I needed a gardener to take care of the grounds. So I just interviewed a few of the groundskeeping people in the area and took one. Uh, now I had the grounds taken care of. I don't have to do that job now. The next thing I got was I need a maintenance man. I need somebody to fix everything that comes up. Uh, I don't need to be getting any phone calls anymore about something that's broken. And so I hired, uh, my first one was a contractor who does small jobs. And so he would do my stuff kind of on his way to or from whatever bigger job he was doing. And so he um, did that for a year or so. And then he got too busy and he just couldn't do my little stuff anymore. And so then I hired a maintenance man to do the job. Um, and so what happens is, it, you know, everybody has a phone number to call. If you have any maintenance issues, you need something fixed, call this number. That number was to get the maintenance man, not me. They would call the maintenance man and the maintenance guy would just take care of it. And then the, uh, first thing I knew about it usually was cause I got a bill in the, in the mail for something that he bought, you know, uh, or I was reimbursing him for stuff that he did. Um, then the next thing I needed was things like appliances. Okay. When, if you want to automate this, so you don't have to do the work, you can't be buying your appliances at home Depot. You know, when somebody calls that the refrigerator is out and that needs to be taken care of pretty quickly, they can't be having their, all their food spoil. You can't be running down to the Home Depot to see what refrigerator they have on sale, get one and haul it over there and put it in. That isn't going to work. What I did was go to a local appliance uh, company, somebody local, not a big box store, and say, I've got these rentals. I want you to have all the business. And we set up a plan. I picked out the refrigerator I want. I picked out the stove I want. I picked out the dishwasher I want and gave them my credit card and they had an account for me. And so what would happen? Let's say now, now the refrigerator goes out. They call the maintenance guy and say, hey, my refrigerator's out. The maintenance guy pops over there and makes sure it's not like a breaker or the switch had gone bad or something, that it's really, the refrigerator is, is dead. Uh, and then he would make one phone call to the appliance company and say, I got this refrigerator out at this address. This is the person, tenant's name and here's their phone number. And then the maintenance guy was all done. Now those guys would contact the tenant and set up a time for them to come and they would just come and take care of it. They had a fix or replace order. If they checked out the refrigerator and it just needed a part replaced, they'd replace the part. If the compressor was gone, they needed to replace the refrigerator. They just swapped them out. And the only thing I heard about was they would send me the receipt in the mail that the uh, refrigerator was replaced. <laughs> I got the invoice, you know, when it, when it showed up. And then my wife would log it in the computer because we write that off. So you don't have to do any of those things. You have your maintenance man as your shield. They take care of everything. Maybe you have a maintenance woman. I don't know, you know, but for me, I had a person, maintenance man. Maintenance so I keep, person, human. <laughs> I keep saying maintenance man because that's who I had. It was a guy and I called him my maintenance man. So um, he, he makes the phone call. He makes the decision and he calls the appliance guy and they already have instructions and just take care of everything. The same thing then for flooring. So anything that you have that repeats, you have another one, you know, you're, you're going to need flooring in the future. You're going to need more carpet later. You're going to need new linoleum in the, in the um, kitchen. You know, and, uh, you go to the uh, flooring place, you pick out a vinyl and you pick out a carpet or you pick out some uh, of those new planks, uh, vinyl planks. 
uh, you pick out what you want and you give that information to the maintenance man and you've got an account with them and now if the maintenance guy is doing a room turnover and he sees that I'm going to have to replace the carpet, uh, he just calls the carpet guys and they take care of it. And guys, Send don't get invoice. scared because he's talking about spending so much money in these refrigerators and this carpet and all this stuff. But the truth is that that was part of the calculation that they did before. So you're saving yes. money for your for your uh, replacements, for your uh, maintenance and all that stuff. That's part of the cash on cash calculator that, you know, your, your calculations that you do before purchasing anything because it's really a business. So you have to do that. Um, and you, you have to understand... It. You're not going to have a refrigerator go out every day. But here's the thing. If, if, if an appliance lasts 10 years and I have 64 rental units and each one has an air conditioner, a refrigerator, a stove, a, a, you know, you can calculate that every month I will have an appliance go out somewhere. Uh, and so it's an ongoing event. But you can predict it, just like insurance people can can predict, you know, life insurance, uh, how many people are going to die. You can predict what your appliance lives are going to be like, and it goes into your calculations when you're buying the place. So you already planned on spending that money. You just didn't know which appliance you'd be buying or which unit it would be in. But I had something like 250 appliances uh, in my 64 units. So, you know, back in 2008, when the crash happened and, and everything kind of shut down, uh, people stopped buying appliances. And my appliance guy said to me that our 64 rental units that we exclusively went through them single-handedly, we kept his business alive mm. because he had regular business. We were, we were replacing those things when they broke. And he got regular business during that time frame when everything else kind of shut down. And so when you have a relationship developed like that, those guys service you well. They, I kept his business alive. Now if I call and say I need something, I go to the top of his list. And he, he's ready to come see me because I'm, he knows I'm exclusively using them. And, and that's so, something about, you know, when we're building, people say, oh, I'm a doctor. How am I going to do this thing? How am I going to help people? Well, you know what? Right? You're helping people because you're giving them places to live that are safe. And you're also connecting with your community. Um, we haven't had any questions that I haven't seen here. Remember to do hashtag live has every play. I have one last question before we go. And it's about your criteria. Are we going already? Huh? We're going we're, already? We're going already. We have to go soon. Like we've been here. Let's see. It's going to be 40 minutes shortly. And uh, I know it's fun. Like fun is like time goes so fast when you're having fun. So one last question I have. And if you want to add something that we, you, we think that we cannot go without that, yes, please do it. Um, in terms of the value add, when you're trying to get your criteria for your properties, What's your criteria for any renovations? Are you, you know, we're not going to get a, turn, a turnkey thing, but uh, what, what was your specific criteria for that? My specific criteria was to not do it. Uh, one of my criteria was I want property that isn't a fixer upper. I'm busy. I'm a surgeon. I have too much time to be futzing around with a renovation. Okay. So when I was buying property, one of my criteria was that the prior owner has been taking care of the place and there are no major obvious renovations that need to be done. I was not trying to buy cheap properties that were on sale because they were worn out and they needed a lot of work. I didn't have the time or energy to do all of that stuff. Okay. So as a busy professional, I think that's one thing that you should avoid. The flipping idea uh, or the major fixer-upper stuff, okay? Later on, I did one. I bought one to fix up. And what I learned doing that was everything cost more than you thought it would uh, because you would start to fix this one thing and you'd find another problem as you're working on that one. Like, let's say there was a problem on the window seal that needed to be, or you need to replace the window. You go to replace the window, and then you find some dry rot in the corner. And now you got to replace that, 
and then you got to repaint this section. You know, it's like when you go to renovate things, uh, if you're going to do renovation, renovation work, always overestimate what you think it's going to cost you because you're going to run into things that you can't see currently. Now, as a professional, I didn't want to get into that stuff. So I wanted places that are, are in pretty good shape. As time went by, we did renovate some stuff as it happened. Um, and we already had money set aside as the money came in. Don't spend all your money as it comes in. You set aside portions of it for future things that happen. You will need a new roof someday. Those aren't cheap. You will need new flooring someday. So when you make estimates, uh, let's say that you estimated $75 per door per month as uh, future repair expenses, um, if you didn't have any repairs this month, you still set that money aside. So it will be there when those renovations do come. And, and they will happen. Every now and then, someone will destroy your apartment. I mean, it, it, it just happens. Once in a while, you walk in and you say, oh, my goodness, what happened here? Okay, now that one's going to take a bunch of money to fix it. And so uh, my repair guy, my, my maintenance guy, he spearheaded taking care of everything. And what he couldn't do himself, we had a contractor that worked for us. And that contractor did this thing, the bigger jobs that my repair guy couldn't do. He did the little stuff. And then if anything big happened, like we had, um, we had a, a, the railings. There was an upstairs uh, balcony thing and, and the railings were wooden and they were uh, rotting and, and beginning to be unsafe. I was afraid they were going to break. Someone would lean on them and, and they'd break. And so we had to replace all those. So, so the, the maintenance guy wasn't going to be doing that. Uh, and we, he contacted the contractor and then they took care of a major renovation of replacing all the railings, uh, on that. And so I think you should think long and hard about renovating things. Are you the kind of person who wants that kind of a job? Because that's a job when, when you're going to renovate, even if you have someone else doing the work, if you've ever built your own house, you know, you're not doing any of the building, but for some reason, you still had to do a lot of stuff. You're, mm -hmm. you're, you're having to pick out, the, the contractor doesn't usually pick out the stuff. You have to go pick it out because they don't want the responsibility to put the one in that you don't like. So, you, you know, there's, there's a lot of extra work. And if you're going to do renovations, you got to make sure you have the bandwidth in your schedule to add the hours that renovations are going to take because you can buy some great bargains, but they're not as big a bargain as you think if you now have to sink a bunch of more money in. Or you could have just paid a little more money in the first place and have it already fixed. Uh, and, and since you're looking for a positive cash flow, you're okay either way. So myself, I never wanted to tackle that uh, concept of having to buy something that needed renovating. There's a lot of people that go for the value add. They're buying it at one uh, price. And if you renovate it and you can make it a nicer place and you increase the rents, you automatically increase the value of the property. And those people are really after cash out refi because that's what the value increase was for. So they could get their money all back and go to the next deal. But, it, when you do that, your cash flow drops down because when you did the cash out, you made a bigger loan. And so now you have to take less cash flow. I was in the business of having positive income. I wanted the cash flow because I wanted to retire on that cash flow. So I wasn't that big into cash out refinance. I wanted to, to refinance in a way that had good cash flow. And I kind of wanted to do renovations that raised rent that didn't take a lot of money and time on my part. Um, that were quick and easy. And the biggest way to do that is to buy a place who's under rented. Uh, their rents are too low. They haven't been raising the rent. And so what you can do is you just clean it up a little bit and you get it back up to market rent and you, you had a value add without having to do a big renovation. But just by think adding long and hard about how you're going to do that. Are these days, are you going to buy anything else you think? 
Say that again. Are you, buy, are you buying more properties yourself? Are you adding I'm to not, your portfolio? I'm not right now. Um, in the past, uh, I was about to buy the next one because to me it was a it was a really fun game to buy a property, especially if I could work it out to a no money down deal because it was like a game for me. It, it was a lot of fun. Um, my wife didn't see it as such fun. She just saw it took up a little of my more of my time, and I was already a busy surgeon, and so she didn't want that. So at one point she told me, you know, uh, why are you trying to buy more property? We have enough property already that will take care of us for the rest of our life uh, in the cash flow. Now we were buying this property because you wanted cash flow for retirement. You have that. So why are you still looking to buy more property? And so had it been just left up to me, I'd still be buying property today. I I just kept buying another one, another one, another one. But my wife pulled in the reins when she really made me look at the fact that we already met our goal. And once you, if you're running a marathon, when you cross the finish line, you should stop running. And we had our goal was enough cash flow that we could retire on the real estate. And when we reached that, we could stop buying. We don't have to keep going and going and going. It, it's not a forever thing. And so that's one take home point. I wish people could learn that you don't, you, you should draw a line in the sand and say, what is your goal with the real estate you're buying? And so you know that there is a finish line. If your goal is just an extra thousand dollars a month, when you made an extra thousand dollars a month, you don't have to keep going. You, you, you met your goal. If your goal is retirement, if your goal is to own a hundred million dollar portfolio, then you're going to keep going for a while until you get there. But so how much do you need to purchase so that you can go on using your eight weeks of timeshare a year? That was your <laughs> wise goal. Um, for us, uh, you know, that's different everywhere. Okay. So how much property do you need? It's very different on it, depending on how you finance the property. So for instance, in, in the beginning, we bought it no money down. So there's very little cash flow in the beginning. But as we paid off things, now the cash flow kept going up. And as the rents went up, the cash flow kept going up. So for us, the answer was we needed enough cash flow coming in from the properties to exceed our living expenses. Okay. Now, you can increase cash flow by buying one more property that has more cash flow or you can increase cash flow by raising some rent or you can increase the cash flow by paying off the mortgage my wife's idea was why don't we just pay off the mortgage and then we have the cash flow we want we don't have to keep buying more units to get the cash flow we want we could pay the mortgage off and have the cash flow we want how so much money did you spend from your own money on that first deal zero I actually got paid cash back at closing. So I think I got like, I don't know, $23, $2,400, something like $2,000 something dollar check when it closed. And I spent none of my own money on that first deal. Now, what I did was I had the owner carried the main mortgage, which was around 70%, I think, of that deal. And I borrowed the other parts as well. And so I use my own money to help pay down the borrowed down payments. So basically I paid the down payment over time and I used excess money I had to, to then invest in that property. So total, I think we put 400 and something thousand into our real estates in the 21 years we've had them. That's so awesome. early Welcome. on, we put money into them to help pay down the mortgages and we took none of the profits. All of the profit that the property made went to paying down the mortgages because our goal was cash flow and cash flow goes up as the mortgage goes down. So you have less mortgage, you know, when, when you retire, let's say you've paid off half of the mortgage and you're getting ready to retire. Well, refinance that mortgage down to the new value and it'll drop your payment in half and that increased that just doubled your cash flow so we were after cash flow and to do that instead of buying more properties 
we paid off the debt and we got the cash flow. And today the properties make more money than we can spend in a year. I guess you, there's no such thing as so much money. You can't spend it. But in our lifestyle, we have a pretty nice lifestyle. Don't worry. We have some viewers here who will yeah. probably have some ideas of how to spend that extra money that you don't know how to spend. So don't worry. We, we oh, can yeah. come up with some of those. I do it's want to thank you for being here. always a good time to get a new motorhome. Oh, my goodness. I want to thank you for being here with us today. You've been more than generous with your time. And guys, if you want to hear more, just contact us. We have the Max Selling Mastermind. Our website is M-A-X-A-L-L-U-R-E. Uh, remember to do hashtag replay, hashtag live. And um, can you please tell us about where people can contact you so that uh, if they have more questions for you, they can keep learning and getting your books and your resources? Everything can be found at my website, which is financialsuccessmd.com. And if, if you have a question that we didn't answer uh, or you want to talk to me or get a hold of me, uh, my email is md at financialsuccessmd.com. And you can get a hold of me and I'd be happy to talk to you. All of the books and the courses that I have can be found on the website. If you just stop off there, you can find that and that'll also lead you to all the other social media sites I'm at. Just join me on all of them that you're on and then you'll get updates as every time a new article comes out. Well, thank you very much. And you guys have a great weekend. It's a long weekend. Enjoy with your families and friends. And we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.